everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview interview, I'm taking a look at Rommel's War, designed by Derek Croxton and published by Worthington. Worthington did provide this review copy. Rommel's War is a two-player block war game with rules for solitaire play. It covers the North African campaign in World War II from April 1941 to January of 1942. One side plays as the German and Italians, the other side plays as the Commonwealth forces. Let's do a quick overview. I have a complete playthrough video for an in-depth look at the game. I'll cover my pros and cons, and we'll end with my final thoughts. So let's go down to the table. All right, let's go ahead and take a quick look at Rommel's War. Let's look at the map, the units, the cards, the mechanisms, victory loss, and then we'll dive into the rest of the review. Okay, so first off with Rommel's War, as I said, right, it's Axis, which is German and Italians, versus the various allied Commonwealth forces. At the very beginning, um, you are going to have all of your units actually face down. So this is the initial setup where I've drawn the units. You're going to have all the uh, blocks face down here in these force pools for the Axis and for the Allies. You're going to be drawing from them four, or actually three, because the Germans automatically get a Panzer Division deployed out here in the West. The Allies, same thing, they're going to draw four. However, their units are deployed in Alexandria, Tobruk, Makili, and Benghazi. The forces are random, again, besides the one Panzer Division. The Axis, their home base, and this is very, very important because this is where supply comes from and where the units are going to be placed at, those reinforcements, is Alagela. And then for the Allies, it's Alexandria over here on the east. The game is played out over 10 turns. You're going to be fighting over control of Tobruk in the middle and then trying, which most games it won't happen, but it can happen if you watch my playthrough. Spoiler alert, um, one of the home bases can be captured, which ends the game automatically in a decisive victory. So how it happens is you get you do that setup, right? So you have your forces placed face down. You're going to draw, place all of them. The axis here, the allies get placed out. The axis start during the very first turn. They don't get any reinforcements other than that. So starting with the second half of turn one, which you can see the turn track here in the top left, April of 41, right? Goes up to possibly up to January of 42. You're going to follow the sequence of play. First off, receive reinforcements and place a base. You're drawing them randomly from your force pool. Two units each turn, again, besides the axis, the very first turn. They already have four out, and that's all they're going to have. The allies in the second half of turn one do get to draw two, uh, two forces. Afterwards, you're going to draw an initiative card. These, each side has a, a deck of initiative cards. Now, the thanks to you know Rommel's generalship, the... German cards are going to be overall, he has more that give you a bonus and possibly a stronger bonus. However, both sides will have chances to take advantage and use these cards. So looking at the cards themselves. So I drew a German one here. You can see it has no effect. So you're not going to be able to do anything with it that turn. You draw one a turn. You can't save it. You can't do anything like that. You draw one. If you can use it, great. If you can't, oh well, too bad. That's how fortune works, right? Say you draw one though like this. It's very simple. You can here add one additional move, which I'll explain movement in a second here when we get to the next phase of the sequence of play, or you can add plus one to one of your attacks. The Germans have a card. They not only have plus one, they also have card or cards that have plus two. Again, showing to kind of that superior generalship of Rommel compared to, say, General Wavell. Okay, so you have those bonus cards, and I mentioned affecting movement or combat. After you draw your initiative card, you're hanging on to it, you're gonna decide when to use it in the next phase. That is the movement and combat phase. During movement, you can make two moves. Moves are, you pick an area. So say, if it's the Axis turn, Alagela here, I pick this area, I'm gonna activate units for movement. You can activate anywhere from one to four ground units, or you can activate one or two of your air units. They cannot move um, together unless you're using multiple moves you're using both your moves you pick four you're going to move them movement of the game is interesting so they have every unit has an intrinsic movement value which we'll cover the units quick here just so you have an idea but very standard um, you have nato symbology right so say this is recon unit this is a tank unit you can see we have infantry down here as well left side is going to be their combat strength Middle is name of the unit, and then the nation affiliation, and then on the right side is their movement. That's their intrinsic movement. Now, how the game works with movement is if you are following the main road, which is the solid line right here, 
and a little offshoot here to Aladim, all the way east and west, you get bonus movement. You get four bonus moves on that road. Besides the bonus moves, you have your intrinsic, intrinsic movement. So a unit that has, say, an armored unit that has a two movement could potentially move four on the road and then two more thanks to its intrinsic movement. Or you may move several on the road and then cut off onto these trails, the dotted lines, which the trails, there's no bonus movement. It's just your intrinsic movement of that unit. So you move faster on the road, but obviously it's more likely to encounter the opposing forces, which are going to stop your movement. You can try flanking, but again, you're going to have more limited movement. That's where the card, which has that one additional move, can come in to effect. Being able to only move four units at a time, if you have a mass, uh, mass assault, or if you want to attack at multiple points, two moves moving even up to four each may not be enough because you're only activating from a maximum of two areas at that point. So you may need that additional move just to get your forces in position for an attack. So now you move your units, they're in this, occupying the same area as an enemy, you're gonna have combat. Combat, very simple. You're going to add up the attacker strength and the defender strength and compare. Whoever wins, the opposing force has to eliminate a unit and then retreat, defender wins ties as usual in most of these games. Where does this die come in, you say? Well, that's the solitaire aspect of it. So when you're playing two player, right, you're going to have the units hidden from your opponent the majority of the time. There's gonna be times they're gonna be revealed and they're gonna participate in the combat, defender will be revealing them, etc. However, a lot of the times, right, the forces, the, the actual blocks are gonna face away from your opponent. They're not gonna know. And that's that fog of war when you get with two player block games. How do you make up for that with a solitaire game or when playing at solitaire? Well, two things. One, yes, you're playing with the blocks face up. That's why they're face up right now. But two, you're using that die. There are special solo rules for combat. You roll that die on a one to five, and depending on how many units are in that location, how many defending units, it's going to either add the number on here, add half the number, or you're gonna add all of it, and you're gonna roll again and add another half. The stronger the defense is, the more you get it to add from this bonus. So that can cause that a big shift where you as the attacker are moving into an area, you know, you may have a general idea of what the defensive strength is. You may think you may have it exactly. You may be moving in an area with one unit, so you know exactly, you can see exactly what it is. You know you have stronger than that, so you're going to win the combat. Except, if you're not much stronger, the defense is going to roll that die, and it's going to help them. In addition, if you roll a six on the die, the combat is canceled. There's no negative effect for the attacker or defender. However, that combat just isn't going to happen. That creates um, a nice little bit of fog of war, a little bit of uncertainty, a little bit of chaos that you wouldn't necessarily have. Just say, hey, playing you know, with the blocks up and then moving them as you go. Another thing that I do, and you saw this if you watched my playthrough, was when I have stacks of defending units, I place them all, or you have defend, you know, defending units in a location, I place them in stacks with just one unit visible at the top, just to give that little extra fog of war to make sure that even me playing solo, right, I don't remember. I usually don't have every unit memorized, so it gives me that a little bit of questioning of, am I committing enough forces for this attack? Which then you add in that die, and it really creates that suspense and that questioning. Okay, so you've done movement, you've resolved combat, you go to the end phase, you're going to recover and, re and resolve supply. When a unit is forced to retreat, either attack or defender, it's going to become disorganized or disrupted. The various game uses both terms interchangeably. Um, I'll talk about that in my pros and cons. Um, but it's going to basically be either flip down or flip sideways, however you want to designate that it's disrupted. It can no longer participate in attacks. It can defend, it can move, it just can't participate in offensive attacks. However, um, during the recovery, if that unit had been disrupted a previous turn or as a result of being attacked during the earlier part of the turn, so say allied units in the second half of a turn that are attacked by Axis in the beginning of a turn, they can go ahead and recover. Otherwise, you have to wait till the next turn to recover. Supply. Very, very important in this game. So for the Axis, it's going to be traced from Alagala here in the West. For the Allies, they have unlimited supply from Alexandria. And then Tobruk is also has sea supply. However, it's limited in that if a unit is only supplied from Tobruk, so say Tobruk is cut off, right? Um, the line of supply is blocked. Say you have Axis units here in Mursa Matra or Al Almin, and they're blocked from Alexandria. Units here of the allies are still in supply. However, they can only range out to one space away. Gazala, Bardia, and el -Adim. They can't go any farther just because of a limited supply coming from the sea and coming from Tobruk. 
that supply thing is a, was a really big part of the game, obviously, as it was during, you know, the North African campaign, supply meant everything. For the Axis, a particularly long supply line as the farther east they go. Victory loss, pretty simple. You capture either Alexandria or Elegela. Game ends, decisive victory for whichever side uh, captured the opponent's base, or whichever side controls Tobruk at the end is going to have a victory unless it's completely surrounded, and then you're going to go ahead and count the surviving units on the map to determine who edges out the opposition for the win there. Playtime of the game is about an hour. Um, I think my playthrough was about an hour, and that involved a playthrough video, well, probably less of that of actual gameplay, because I spent you know, about 10 minutes explaining the game. Um, so playtime, right on an hour, once you're comfortable playing, maybe a little less. Um, it is not a long game whatsoever. It takes more than you know 20, 30 minutes, but it's not a long game whatsoever. Okay, I think that covered pretty much everything. Again, you can watch my complete playthrough, complete solitaire playthrough, um, to see the game in action with both an explanation, or you can skip that and go right to the gameplay. Otherwise, for now, I think let's go on to the pros and cons. Cons first, and as always, end with my final thoughts. All right, cons first as always. First off, there are some minor typos and errata on the player aid cards. The pack here, it references, it has two sides. It has a regular player's aid side, and it has a solo rule side. The recon aspect here, it does reference um, recon units having their movement being printed in white with a red background. That's not the case, right? The units have just, like every other unit in the game, just has their movement printed in red. Um, that also, I believe, is referenced in the rule book as well. However, the information for the recon, they just have a special movement where their movement is two, they, but they can actually retreat from other two speed units. For instance, they can outrun um, tank units, right? Tank A tank division or tank brigade. Um, so they just have to remember that. It also is printed correctly on here. It just mentions the white with a red background, which is not accurate. Um, the... Like I said, that error has no effect on gameplay. It's the pr And the printed values on all the units are all correct. Everything I've seen so far is accurate and correct. Um, other minor errata is the player aid and uses, when it comes to combat here, um, this is either the player aid or the rule book. It uses the term disrupted here on the player aid. In the rule book, it uses the term disorganized. That's the, after a unit has to retreat, being flipped over or rotated, whatever. They mean the same thing in game terms. So again, it's, it's it's a minor issue, just a little bit of a discrepancy between this player aid and the actual rulebook itself. Second, if you're looking for a dedicated solitaire bot, you won't find it here. The solo rules absolutely help make the game playable solo. More on that later. But you are going to be making choices for both sides. Be aware of that if you only play solitaire games that have bots or where you play against an AI system. The solo rules, other than play with blocks up, which is written in the rulebook, and then this little chart for rolling for combat, which I covered in my overview and I'll talk about a little bit more later, is all there is to the solitaire aspect. Okay, that's it for the cons. Um, on to the pros. First, I love how this game looks on the table. You know, it's, it's a really simple map. But not so simple that it hurts its look or functionality, right? The locations here are all clear. Um, the roads and trails are all very easy to see. They stand out, right? That kind of that the green, but it's like a faded green against that faded tan here. It just it stands out really well. It looks really good. Um, it just makes you think of the desert, right? Um, you know, I always appreciate it also when the sequence of play is printed on the board, which is handy right over here. And, you know, there's enough room here that if you have, yes, if you have a ton of units massed for a major battle, you know, say you're attacking from El Alamein to Alexandria, okay, yeah, and you, you spread them out, right, to count all the strength points, they can start taking up some real estate. But there's still enough room between locations that I've never had any issues telling, you know, where the units are or where a battle is taking place. Sometimes that's a downside, right, of blocks, right, is they can take up a lot of space. In this game, though, because of the, the amount of units and the size of the map, it works out great. The cards, love them. You know, love the, just the, uh, the look of them, obviously, the quality, but which I'll cover in a second. But just kind of seeing them, um, seeing the artwork on there, you know, the general, it's kind of a faded, this gray, but it looks really good. Very clear, obviously, large text, very easy to read. 
and you can set it down somewhere and you're not going to forget, hey, I have that card that I want to use this turn. Okay, uh, you know, overall, well done game board. Okay, I mentioned the cards, right? So second, the component quality is excellent, as expected from Worthington, but always worth mentioning. The mounted map board, these linen finished poker size cards, you name it. And in my opinion, these blocks, these printed blocks, deserve a special mention um, of how nice they look and how, how just great they are, how the feel, the look, just absolutely fantastic. You know, it isn't the first time I've seen them from Worthington, um, but this is the best implementation yet. They're vibrant, they're clear, and I don't have to spend any time putting stickers on the blocks like you have to do with most other block games. Open the box, get ready to set it up, and just play. That aspect is a big quality of life improvement from, you know, punching counters and stickering blocks. The separate player aids, as I already mentioned, you know, one covering combat, combat, and then the different special kind of aspects of aircraft, forts, recon, anti-tank, and then the other half um, covering the solitaire combat rule here is a very welcome addition. You guys, if you watch my videos, you know I love my player aids. I think they help immeasurably by keeping your eyes out of that rule book and on the board itself playing the game. Third thing, the game itself, it adjusts easily for solitaire play. Yes, it's a two-player block war game at its core, and I bet it plays very well two-player, the way the fog of war and the combat systems works, and I'd love to try it that way. Yet, just playing it solo, I had no problems playing both sides. You know, when playing solitaire, you play with all the blocks face up, and you use that die with the game to assist with the combat. That solo combat roll, incorporating the die roll, it's quick, it's easy, yet it opens the game up to a really satisfying solitaire experience. Based on that die roll alone, right, the defense could get a small boost, a large boost, or combat could be invented entirely for roll of six. It's a simple thing that brings back some of that fog of war and uncertainty they don't often get with non-block war games where you have an, you know, an eagle's eye view of the entire map, the entire game. Another aspect of the design I love is the random setup and drawing of units. You put all the blocks, as I mentioned, aside from the two Panzer divisions face down in the unit draw pools, and you draw randomly at setup and during each turn's reinforcement phase. That adds a lot of uncertainty as you'll never know exactly what units are going to be available to you. To me, it adds a lot of replayability and a fog of war element that works both for the two player and in the solo game. Finally, while Rommel's War has a light rule set, I believe it punches thematically above its weight. It feels like a North African campaign game, with you always worried about that movement, supply lines, the punch of armored units, the presence of Tobruk, right, as either a bulwark or a thorn in your side. I, play, I played this game multiple times. I played it where the Axis swept past Tobruk and threatened Alexandra right at the end, right up until the end. Uh, the very next game, I played the Axis got bogged down around Tobruk. The Commonwealth was actually flanking them, going on the trails. And suddenly the Axis were in danger of being cut off and losing half their army. In fact, they were completely cut off and only had a breakout at the last second, having to abandon Tobruk just to go back into supply to make sure they didn't have their forces eliminated. If you watch my playthrough, you saw an example where the Axis took advantage of some poor allied maneuvering. Um, <clears throat> since I'm solitary, I guess that was my fault to send armored units, you know, punching in on a blitzkrieg to take Alexandria and win a decisive victory. You never know what's going to happen. Even when playing solitaire, every game seems to play out differently. To me, that is a huge plus for a war game. Okay, that's it for my pros and cons. Let's end with my final thoughts. I absolutely love Rommel's War. I was concerned about how I would play solitaire, but it turns out I shouldn't have been worried. Not only can you easily play with the blocks face up, the small addition of that solo combat role has a large yet positive impact on the game. I have no problem recommending Rommel's War based on the solo gameplay alone. The game isn't an in-depth simulation, but it doesn't claim to be. You know, yet, yet the theme, the feeling of the North African theater is strong. And aside from those minor typos and errata that I mentioned, you know, overall the rulebook is well written and the game feels very polished. Games often, as I described, swing back and forth. You know, this isn't a, I saw some comment on BGG about being a Rommel-centric game. Yes, it's, it's Rommel's War, right? And that may help sell the game. 
Rommel's not going to win every time. The Axis are not going to win every time. The Allies are going to give it just as much as they get it. You can never be sure which side is going to win until either the very end or something surprising happens when some armored units are able to maneuver in just the right way to kind of cut off the head at the last second. Again, you can watch my video playthrough for just one example of that happening. Rommel's War is a great game, and playing it creates memorable experiences. Well done, Derek Croxton, and to the team at Worthington. Thank you to everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video review. Please let me know what you think of my video and this game in the comments below. Until next time, everyone. Later.